All right, it is just after seven o'clock, so we will get started here. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Alan Orsi with Park Corporation. I'm here to uh, uh, start up the uh, the second public meeting for the Bentley Creek Watershed uh, Watershed Project Plan and Environmental Assessment. Uh, today's objectives, uh, four primary objectives we've identified on the screen here. Uh, first, we wanted to review the program in general that the project's being completed under. And then we want to talk a little bit about the, the Bentley Creek watershed, its background and its history. Uh, then we'll move into reviewing some of the study elements that have been completed as part of this study. Uh, and then finally, uh, we want to encourage all those participating as well as the public and large to provide input and contribute to the process. This is a, a public process, so we certainly appreciate people's feedback. Uh, before I turn it over to David Wolowski from the New York NRCS, I just wanted to touch on some meeting logistics. Uh, so all attendees and attendance will be muted, uh, but there are a couple of options that you can use to participate in the meeting. Uh, number one is the chat box in the uh, uh, Zoom control bar. Uh, you can send direct messages to myself. We'll be monitoring the comments throughout the presentation uh, and we'll address those when, when we have the, the opportunity. Uh, there's also, also the option to click on the reactions tab or button in the control bar. Uh, and then if you raise your hand, uh, we'll keep an eye on those and we will uh, welcome questions uh, again when the opportunity presents itself. Uh, finally, before we get started, I do just ask you uh, to, to function as a, a sign-in sheet. Uh, we ask everybody in the chat box just to enter your name, uh, email address, as well as your affiliation so that we can have a record of those in attendance with us today. And I'll give you just a, a moment so that you can find that, that chat button and get that information entered. Uh, we do want to note that this meeting is being recorded. And after the meeting is complete, we'll make a, uh, a copy of the recording available to those interested. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, David Wolowski, who's going to give you some, uh, some introductions and backgrounds. Thank you, Alan. Uh, again, welcome to everyone on the on the call tonight for our second public meeting uh, for the Bentley Creek Watershed uh, Project. Uh, I'd like to welcome our local sponsors, uh, Bradford County Commissioners uh, in Pennsylvania, Kathy Yakel, Bradford County Conservation District, uh, Henry Jerzak, Mayor, Village of Wellsburg, New York, Fern Robinson, Town of Ashland, New York, um, I see that Mr. Strange is on with the Shemung County Legislature and Karen Tillotson with the Shemung County District. Next slide. Uh, my name is David Wolosi. I'm with NRCS in New York uh, on the state office staff. Uh, my, my, I guess my counterpart in Pennsylvania, Heather Smeltz, out of the Harrisburg State Office. Um, Heather, do you want to say anything? No, but I do want to say thank, well, I guess I do. Thank you for all for your interest in attending this meeting tonight. Thanks, David. Thanks, Heather. And our consultant team, uh, Park Corporation and Tetra Tech, Alan Orsi and Sarah Watts. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna turn off my video and we'll continue. So the presentation overview, uh, we're gonna cover the planning team roles, project background, brief background, outline of the planning process, project resources, uh, the study findings, alternatives considered, environmental concerns, what our next steps are, and then an open discussion at the end of the presentation. So the role of the local sponsors, uh, I listed those in the, in the, uh, in the first, um, first slide for introductions. Uh, the sponsors are responsible for permits, and the long-term operation and maintenance of the project, any land right acquisition and utilities. The role of NRCS, we are the primary administrator of the project. NRCS conducts the final review of all project documents per the contract. And we, we are responsible for coordinating with the public, tribes and government agencies. The role of the engineering consultant Par Corporation and Tetra Tech uh, conduct field reconnaissance and gather background data for the project, complete engineering analysis to characterize the watershed, 
develop and evaluate potential flood prevention strategies and prepare the final project documents. So why are we here? Uh, we're gonna cover a brief history of the project, why this is a new project and how the process works. So the Bentley Creek watershed historically been flooded as all of you are aware, 11 significant floods in the past 90 years. Next please. A Couple of slides from the 2011 flood in the village of Wellsburg. Next slide, please. So th this slide shows a, a number of watershed um, and flood prevention projects across the United States. Uh, the 1954 Watershed Protection and Flood Prevention Act, commonly known as Public Law 83-566, authorizes the Secretary of Agriculture to provide technical and financial assistance to local organizations for planning and carrying out watershed projects. This program provides for cooperation between the federal government and local government entities such as states, counties, municipalities, villages, etc., to work together to prevent erosion, flood water and sediment damage among other purposes. Uh, nationwide, NRCS has worked to plan and implement over 2000 PL 566 projects, including almost 12,000 dams. Next slide, please. In New York, we've planned and implemented 31 PL 566 projects with just over half of them to install 59 flood control dams and four flood control dikes across the state. Next slide, please. In Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania has implemented over 60 watershed projects and approximately 80 to 85 flood control dams across the state. Next slide, please. So project history uh, goes back a long ways. Uh, starting in 1965, there was an application submitted for assistance under the 566 program. In 1967, the first report was, was uh, finalized and determined that the project was not feasible. Similar occurrence in, in 1972 following Hurricane Agnes. It wasn't until um, 1994 that there was a request to, for the sponsors to withdraw their application. Um, and and it, sponsors refused to do that. So that takes us to the next slide. Uh, in 1994, there was a series of flooding events highlighting flood damages. Uh, January of 1996, rapid snow melt, ca snow melt causes extensive flooding and stream bank erosion within the project area. October of 96, there was a coordinated resource management meeting uh, between the interested parties. And in December of 97, the third report uh, indicated that the project was potentially feasible, the priority was elevated, and some preliminary planning was initiated. In 2002, it actually should be August of, uh, between 2002 and August of 2012, planning under, was underway low to moderate annual funding received and uh, essentially the planning effort that was conducted between 2002 and 2012 um, ceased be, uh, due to no funding to take it to the next step. In 2017, initial, additional funding to the watershed and flood prevention operation programs was received. And in 2019, the sponsors apply to USDA NRCS for assistance under the 566 program. And in November of 2020, NRCS contracted with Par Corporation to commence planning. Next slide, please. So why the new project? Uh, we know that flooding occurs in Wellsburg, 11 historical flood events uh, over the past 90 years. And there was additional funding to uh, move this project forward and start the planning process. Next slide, please. So again, in 2019, project sponsors requested funding through the Watershed and Flood Prevention Operations Program to address the residual flooding along Bentley Creek. 
So the watershed project plan uh, starts with a feasibility study. Um, we consider several project alternatives. We have to evaluate those alternatives against environmental and public concerns, and then determine if the project should be funded for the next phase, which would be design. Next, please. So a rough timeline um, for the planning process. Uh, we have to determine, uh, develop a purpose and need. Uh, the pl planning process outline and activities have to follow the NEPA process. We look at human and environmental resources, overview of the project area, and flood prevention and damage reduction potential solutions. The watershed and flood prevention operations process is a lengthy process, as many of you know, and as we've just discussed and, and outlined in the previous slides. A planning effort takes approximately two years, followed by a design process, phase two years and construction. So ideally, we're looking at six years uh, by the time the planning effort starts and construction um, is completed. So, you know, the process takes a long time. It is a deliberate and intentional process. And it's better to uh, uh, move slowly than, than quickly and, and miss something along the way. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Watts. Thanks, David. So public participation is a big part of the NEPA process and there are multiple times specifically designed for public input such as public meetings like this, um, providing the public with opportunity to review documents and then getting input from the public by providing these opportunities to comment at, at various stages in the project. The best way to stay current on the project progress and, and be informed of key comment timelines is to get on the NRCS's mailing list for this project, um, put your contact information in the meeting chat, um, and or email the project email account, which I know will be presented um, at the end of this presentation. And with that, you will get uh, the periodic updates, um, get on the list for periodic updates. You can also check out the Bradford County or Chemung County websites, um, and those will have updates as the study progresses. So where we're at in the NEPA process now is basically the second box from the left, prepare the draft plan, environmental assessment or plan EA document. Um, we held the public scoping meeting almost a year ago where we notified the agencies that the public and the public of the intent to conduct a project and we were receptive to comments on the project then. We've developed and evaluated alternatives which included collecting project specific data including biological and cultural field reconnaissance surveys um, and those helped to develop our understanding of the existing conditions. Um, at this point, we've defined a likely preferred alternative that incorporates structural and non-structural components, and we'll be going into detail on that in a few minutes. And um, we're in the process of analyzing the impacts associated with the likely preferred alternative and the no action or future without federal investment alternative. We're working on preparing the draft plan EA, which includes identifying proposed measures to mitigate adverse impacts to the resource areas considered by NEPA. Um, I'll go into a little more detail on that on the next slide. Um, but when the draft plan EA documents ready, there'll be a public review period of about 30 days. And that is in the middle orange box on this slide. During this period, the public and the agencies get to review the draft plan EA document and provide comments to the NRCS project team. We'll notify, we will notify the public when this comment and review period will be with the notice of availability. And that will say how and where to access the document and also how and when you can submit your comments. Um, the next step is the second box from the right now, and that's to finalize the plan EA. During that stage, we'll address all the public and agency comments received on the draft document. We'll finalize the plan EA and in include the list of measures to avoid, minimize and mitigate any adverse impacts. Once that's done, a final findings statement would be completed as a decision document, such as a finding of no significant impact or FONSI, or a recommendation to prepare uh, an environmental impact statement or EIS. 
Um, so we invite you, the public, to help shape the project throughout the NEPA process. Next slide, please, Alan. Um, so here's a list of the environmental resource topics that we plan to cover in the plan EA document. It's similar to many other environmental assessments for other similar projects. However, each project's different and, and unique. So feel free to take a look at these topics. Um, and then as you listen to the rest of the presentation, you can keep these in mind. Um, I'll discuss the potential adverse impacts to these resource areas later in the presentation based on the likely preferred alternative that Alan will present. And if you have any input or comments related to the resource area impacts or any other issues or concerns, we welcome you to submit your comments following the presentation. So at this point, I'm gonna hand things over to Alan um, and he will take it to uh, into the next uh, details. Okay, great, thanks, Sarah. Um, so at the initial public meeting, we talked a little bit about the engineering studies that were going into this uh, watershed plan. And this really starts with the, the hydrologic model, which is the, the model that determines how much water is going to flow down the river during uh, a variety of storm events, ranging from the, the, the one year up to the 100 year, and as well as looking at the, the 500 year storm event as well. Uh, so that hydrologic model was actually completed before the initial public meeting. Uh, and I think during the initial public meeting, we had started to take that hydrologic model, which tells us how much water and what flow rates are coming down the river. And we started putting it into a hydro hydraulic model. <clears throat> and what the hydraulic model is, it's a, a 2D representation of the topography within the, the study reaches. Uh, what we can do is we can take the, the flow rates and the, the, flow, the flood hydrograph from the hydrologic model and run them through this hydraulic model. And the, that mo or the hydraulic model will then in turn tell us some characteristics of the flooding. Uh, characteristics include the, the lateral extents of flooding. Uh, so that gives us the, the elevation or the, the depth of flood waters that we expect at different locations within the, the, the project study area. Uh, we can also pull out other information such as uh, flow velocities, whether the, the flow in the, or the flow predicted by the hydraulic model is quickly moving, or if it's a more of a, a, a static flood water within the, within the floodplain. Um, so we developed the hydraulic model for the, the Bentley Creek ranging from the downstream terminus at the confluence with the Chemung River uh, and extending a little bit upstream of the, of, of, uh, the village of, of Bentley Creek. Um, and what we did is we ran this model for a variety of storm events. Uh, the next few slides, what I'm going to present is the results of those models for both the 10-year the storm event and the 100-year, the 1% chance recurrent flood event. Um, we also took this flooding information and compared it against available uh, land use property records and other GIS information, which allows us to determine the, the or monetize the, the damage associated with each of those flood events. Um, and once we monetize that and evaluate it over the 100 year period of analysis for the, the project, uh, we can normalize that to a annual expected damages or, or EAD. And what that represents is the statistical average damage that is going to occur in a reach uh, during that 100 year period of analysis uh, during each year. Uh, so here we're showing Wellsburg. Uh, these charts are all going to show the, the 10 year event, uh, which is, was, we selected that because it's a little bit representative of some of the flooding that's been experienced in the past, uh, particularly that, that 2011 flooding. So on the left here, we have the village of Wellsburg and the blue shade indicates the, the flooding that occurs during a 10 year storm event. Uh, and then the right side of the screen here is the flooding that would occur during a hundred year storm event. Again, looking at that economic analysis, uh, we were able to determine that the EAD, or the expected annual damages, uh, within this portion of the study in Wellsburg, uh, just about $240,000 per year. Moving a little bit upstream to the location of Durabilt, this is shortly uh, over the, the New York line into Pennsylvania. Again, we have that 10-year flooding on the left side of the screen and the 100-year flooding on the right side of the screen. Uh, and as you can see, uh, during a 10-year storm event, we have some shallow flooding within the area of Durabilt. Uh, but then certainly during the 100-year event, we have extensive flooding, not only around Durabilt, 
but also the mobile home community to the south, uh, portions of Berm Berwick Turnpike, and some residential areas uh, on the other side of the, the roadway there. Uh, using the economic analysis, expected damages in this area are on the order of about $208,000 per year. Uh, moving further upstream or further south to Centerville, uh, again, we're looking at the 10-year the and the 100-year flooding. Uh, this area, not as much flooding within developed portions of the watershed, uh, some flooding of residential properties as well as roadway damage. Uh, annualized, we're looking at uh, EADs of about $28,000. And then finally, Bentley, or the, in the area of Bentley Creek, a um, little bit less flooding up here, uh, somewhat a function of the, the drainage area contributing to this stretch is, is smaller. Uh, and also that the development isn't quite as dense. Uh, so expected annual damages in this stretch uh, approaching $5,000 per year. Uh, now there's a number of other areas within the, the, the study that were, were evaluated and assessed. Um, we kind of focused on those four areas for the, the previous four slides, but you now flooding does occur along the entire model reach. Um, some areas denser uh, damage than, than others, uh, and primarily driven by the, the extent of development within the, the floodway, as well as the, the proximity of those houses to the, to the river itself. Uh, so our study didn't just uh, consider flow rates, uh, but we also did a geomorphic analysis. And this was really looking at how the river transports sediment through its reaches. Uh, so the chart at the, uh, the bottom left here is showing different reaches of Bentley Creek. Uh, we divide the river up into sections with similar characteristics with SR1 uh, being the, the upstream most reach of the river uh, approaching Bentley Creek. Um, and moving downstream to SR15, uh, which really represents the, the confluence with the Chemung River. Um, our study didn't or wasn't scoped to identify sources of sedimentation or identify measures to mitigate that sedimentation, uh, but rather we wanted to look at the sedimentation so that we could determine if sediment within the river was going to have an impact on the proposed measures. Um, the charts here are showing the net aggradation and degradation. So at, uh, we have the, the zero foot line down the middle. Any bar that's ex extending above that line is uh, channel aggradation. Uh, so sediment's gonna be deposited in that reach. Any bar that's going downward from that line is channel degradation. So we're gonna see some, some erosion and scour. Uh, these charts represent the depth of sediment uh, accumulation or erosion that might occur during the 100-year period of analysis. I would really just look at this to determine if the, the net result was going to have an effect on our proposed measures uh, so that that could be accounted for within economic and design uh, considerations. Uh, we highlighted a couple locations here, uh, number one at Durabilt and then also at, at Wellsburg. And what this is showing us is that at, at Thoroughville, uh, over the, the study period, uh, just a little bit less than a couple inches of sediment degradation or channel degradation. And at Wellsburg, we do have some, some deposition. Uh, this 1.6 feet of sediment deposition was considered as part of the conceptual design for some of the, the proposed measures that I'll present in a, a couple slides here. So, uh, again, referring back to the initial public meeting, uh, there's a, a bunch of different techniques that can be considered for um, flood mitigation and reduced damages within a, a study reach. Uh, these include flood volume and rate reduction. Uh, flood, flood volume reduction might be a, a flood control dam. Uh, and while we screened those out, they were largely scoped out early on given the significant environmental consequences associated with building a, a new dam structure and really rate reduction measures such as uh, local infiltration basins and those types of structures uh, weren't um, effective at providing the scale of flood uh, reduction that's required for this, uh, this particular watershed. Um, avoidance deals with uh, relocation and retreat from the floodplain. Uh, so basically taking any damage susceptible structures and moving them out of the floodplain. Uh, flood proofing is a tool that can be used where flood depths are relatively shallow and not necessarily quick moving. 
Um, so that was certainly an alternative that was considered as part of our uh, plan development here. Um, barriers, these are uh, levees and flood walls. And those are certainly uh, one of the, the key factors considered for, for this study here on uh, drainage improvements is, is another uh, potential solution. Uh, sample drainage improvement might be widening a culvert that's functioning as a, a restriction. On uh, large part, these weren't really applicable to our study reaches. Uh, there was some opportunity to uh, increase a, a bridge down or the railroad bridge down at Front Street, uh, but from a screening level economic analysis, uh, that option was not was not identified as uh, economically feasible, uh, so it wasn't evaluated in uh, in detail. Uh, but what was identified in, in, or for for detailed consideration were a number of levees. Uh, the original screening of the hydraulic model identified up to ten locations that could benefit from the construction of a levee for flood control purposes. I have them listed out here on the the screen, I'm not gonna read through them, but we screened each of these from an economic standpoint to determine if the level of protection offered by the, the levy, so the, the flood damage reduction was uh, feasible from a cost standpoint and the benefit cost ratio of installing that levy. Uh, based upon that screening, it really came down to just two locations where it was economically feasible. Uh, and these include the Wellsburg, the village of Wellsburg, as well as in the area of the Durabilt facility. So looking at these two levees that were determined to be economically feasible, uh, we ran through a number of uh, design options or, or alignments for those uh, levees. Uh, those are kind of represented by these spaghetti diagrams here, um, each color representing a different levee alignment that was considered. And these were screened against the, a variety of factors. Number one, their, their effectiveness at uh, protecting the areas that we wanted to protect. It, to protect. Uh, but we, we also screen them against their environmental impacts, uh, both uh, trying to avoid work within floodways, uh, as well as protecting existing resource areas. So looking a little bit closer at the Wellsburg levy, uh, the red line on the left here represents what the, the currently likely preferred alternative is, is shaping up to look like. Uh, a balance of uh, providing hydraulic capacity, protecting the areas to be protected, as well as trying to preserve resource areas in the levee area. Uh, we ran this levee through an economic analysis. Uh, so with this proposed alignment, we'd be looking at protecting uh, 100 parcels uh, with 149 parcels located, or 149 structures located uh, within those parcels. Uh, the cost of this uh, levee and this an, an annualized cost over the, the period of analysis is about $300,000 per year. Uh, that's compared to the $239,000 of predicted damages that would be avoided by the levy. Uh, so that gives us a, a net cost for this uh, levy in Wellsburg of about $61,000 per year, a cost ratio of about 0 0.8 at a total cost of about $11 million. Uh, we did the same type of analysis for the Durabilt alignment, uh, taking into consideration the, the variety of alignments that we looked at. Um, basically, the, uh, the currently likely preferred alternative includes the, the red line shown on the image to the left, uh, seeking to or looking to protect 10 parcels with a total of 19 structures. Uh, cost annualized is about $107,000 $107, per year. Uh, to avoid $208,000 of damages. Uh, so this gives us a, a attractive benefit cost ratio of about 2.0 uh, with a total cost of about $4 million. So as I mentioned before, the alternatives assessment not only included the, the barriers or the, the levies that were presented on the previous two slides, but it also includes a number of non-structural measures. Uh, the first of these measures is a, a buyout and, and relocation. So that's that avoidance technique. Uh, and this would be the uh, voluntary purchase acquisition uh, and restoration to natural conditions of uh, 18 parcels, including 33 structures. Uh, the economic analysis found a, a benefit cost ratio of about 0.9 at a total cost of about three and a half million. 
Um, amongst the non-structural measures, uh, the economics didn't support the um, barriers for the mobile home communities impacted. Uh, so this buyout and relocation includes a reestablishment option. And it's basically the relocation of existing mobile home communities to a new location outside of the floodplain. Uh, so while we're only looking at three parcels uh, within this measure, uh, there's 122 structures included. Um, the BCR on this portion of the project is about 0 0.5 at a cost of $4.3 million. Uh, we also looked at flood proofing, uh, whether that be, be wet uh, flood proofing, so uh, protecting the, the utility room so that flood waters can enter and leave a building without resulting in structural damage, or dry proofing, improving the foundation so that the flood waters don't get into the building. Uh, there were 39 parcels with 65 structures uh, under the flood proofing measure uh, with a BCR of 0 0.8 at a cost of $2.5 million. Uh, we also looked at some uh, what we called secondary structure relocation. Um, and this differed a little bit from the, the buyout and relocation because they were uh, secondary structures or outbuildings on a parcel where it appeared there was the opportunity to relocate that structure on the same parcel. Uh, this occurred on 15 parcels affecting 34 structures, uh, resulted with a, again, a BCR uh, right about 0.8 at a cost of about a million dollars. Uh, so this slide is a uh, compilation of a lot of the economic data that was presented on the, the previous slides. Uh, but what we wanted to show here is that the program includes uh, the six measures uh, listed here. Um, and those measures result in the flood mitigation for 68% of the parcels and 75% of the structures within the study uh, impact area. Um, and that really represents a, um, a damage reduction of about 95% of the damage within the watershed. Uh, so if you bear with me for a second, we're gonna jump out of PowerPoint to um, some plans that show the, the likely preferred alternatives more graphically, uh, just to lay this out a little bit better than the, the text provided on the, the previous pages. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll walk through the, the likely preferred plan elements. Uh, we'll start at the, the downstream limit at Wellsburg and work our way upstream and just touch on some of the, the key points or key, uh, key factors or elements of the, the likely preferred plan. Uh, we have the legend here showing what the, the, the measures might include. Uh, we got the, the purple is a berm relocation. Uh, red is buyout and relocation. Uh, magenta is flood proofing. Uh, the blue shade is no action. These are parcels or structures that are located within the 500 year floodplain, but either due to the depth of flooding or the frequency of flooding. Uh, damages weren't sufficient enough to justify any action on those. Uh, the yellow buildings are going to be ones that are called out for relocation. Uh, Reestablishment is this uh, um, dotted red and white shade. Um, that was the, the mobile home communities that we had uh, mentioned previously. And there's a couple of other items that we'll, we'll touch on as we, as we move up the river. So starting with the Wellsburg levy uh, that's represented by the yellow line uh, located between the village of Wellsburg and the Bentley Creek. And we're showing about a hundred structures protected by the, the levy system. Uh, the levy system also includes these green dots which represent culverts and pumps. Um, those will be flat gated uh, culverts that will allow uh, protected side drainage during periods when Bentley Creek is lower than the water within the, the village of Wellsburg. Uh, but in the event that Bentley Creek raises up, the flap gates will prevent backflow into the village and there will be standby pumps to pump out any uh, surface runoff uh, out of the protected area. Uh, I also require a couple of road closures, one to the north along Front Street, 
uh, and one to the south along Main Street. Uh, and these road closures uh, require uh, stop logs or gate closures to be completed, uh, depending upon the, the storm event. Um, the, the, the frequency of operation, uh, well, so the alignment of the, the levy was selected to limit the, the frequency of operation uh, so that there weren't, wouldn't be op any operations required for storms less than about the 25 year storm event. Uh, this area also shows in the, the red hatched areas, uh, a couple of uh, buyout and relocation properties. And these are buildings that are within the floodplain where flood depths are gonna result in significant damages, uh, but the economics to provide other protection measures didn't support um, protecting of the, the, the buildings. So relocation's the, the preferred option there. Uh, south of the village of Wellsburg, a couple of features that I wanted to call out. Uh, Tyler Run currently comes from the east. Uh, and right now it flows through a artificial channel that was constructed through the, uh, the village of, of, of uh, or the, through the protected area along the, the east side of the ball fields before joining Bentley Creek down in this area here. Um, to allow for the, the levee to be constructed, uh, Tyler Run is going to need to be relocated. Um, this is actually going to be relocated back to the, the approximate location of the original alignment. Uh, at some point in the past, it was re relocated to the north. Uh, so this plan would include relocating that back to the, the original alignment. Uh, this purple area south of Wellsburg, there's currently a, a berm in place. Uh, it's unclear when the berm was constructed, uh, but likely in response to past channel dredging operations or flood control efforts, uh, that berm will be removed as part of the plan uh, to allow reconnection of the, the floodplain between that existing berm and the proposed levee alignment. And this will allow or ask, this will also result in some improved hydraulics as water flows down past the village of, uh, of Wellsburg. So continuing upstream, um, this is approaching the boundary between the state of New York and Pennsylvania. Uh, this is the Bella Air um, mobile home community, uh, which is being identified as a reestablishment uh, option. Uh, also within the stretch, there's a number of blue buildings that are within the limits of inundation, but as I mentioned, uh, the, the depth and frequency and expected damages are low enough that measures to, to protect those structures are not justified. Uh, there's also a, a number of structures in here that are calling for, for flood proofing. Those are the, the buildings in Magenta. Uh, that's where flooding is excessive enough that uh, flood uh, protection measures are warranted. Uh, there's a handful of build, rear buildings, uh, the yellow buildings. Uh, those are the ones that would that have the opportunity to be re relocated on the same parcel so that they aren't um, exposed to damages by, uh, by regular flood events. Again, the red shading is uh, areas where flooding is expected to result in damages justifying a uh, buyout and relocation program. Uh, scrolling further down, this is in the Durabilt project location. Uh, again, the yellow line representing the levee alignment. Uh, because of proximity of the building to the Bentley Creek Channel, uh, we have a couple of cyan sections here. Um, those will be structural flood walls as opposed to earthen levees. Uh, similar to Wellsburg, there'll be some culverts with flap gates and standby pumps to deal with landside drainage issues. Uh, as well as uh, this, uh, this location includes a buried culvert realignment uh, that's required for hydraulic performance of the system. Um, you may note that the area protected by the levee actually extends to the north beyond the levee limits. And this is just a function of the hydraulic performance of the channel, uh, the, the hydraulic influence of, that the levee has on water surface elevations so that the levee upstream actually results in, in reduced surface waters downstream, uh, allowing uh, those structures also to be effectively protected by the, the levee system. Again, the mobile home community has been identified to be reestablished at a location outside of the floodplain. And we have a couple of uh, storage sheds, uh, self-storage buildings located south of those mobile homes uh, that'll be part of the buyout and relocation program. 
as we extend further south and upstream, again, a, a variety of uh, secondary outbuilding structure location, uh, flood proofing measures, uh, and no action locations, uh, similar to those that were, were presented on the, the previous figures. Uh, so as we approach Centerville and Ridgeberry, uh, again, a little bit more uh, of the, uh, the variety of uh, flood protection measures, again, including the, the no action, uh, flood proofing, uh, relocation of secondary structures. Again, some of our locations where flood depths uh, justify buyout and relocation. Uh, we have a large parcel down here. Really, the development's list limited to a, a handful of buildings on the east side, uh, but the entire lot would be, uh, would be eligible for, for a buyout and relocation, uh, depending upon the, the coordination with that particular property owner. Again, coming south of uh, Centerville, a variety of different flood mitigation structures, a handful of secondary structures uh, in this area here that would require relocation, uh, preferably on site. Um, a lot of these include some, some mobile homes that we, uh, we think there's the opportunity to relocate them on site as opposed to them needing to be reestablished in a different location. Uh, coming up, west of the uh, the main stem uh, Bentley Creek uh, have some some flood protection measures along a tributary um, that continues to the inset down here below uh, but again some some no action elements as well as some uh, flood proofing program uh, components And finally, as we uh, move further south towards the uh, towards Bentley Creek, a uh, number of properties experiencing infrequent uh, limited damage flooding events that no action is, is warranted. Uh, but as we get into the confluence uh, with um, the, the, the Bentley Creek and, um, and Bucks Creek, uh, have some additional flooding that's warranting some, some flood proofing uh, measures. Uh, and then finally, we're going to continue down Berwick uh, Turnpike to the, the southeast, uh, where again, we have a, a scattering of different flood mitigation measures, including no action, flood proofing, and uh, relocation of secondary structures. Uh, similar to the, the previous discussions on mobile homes, there's a handful of mobile homes over here where some relocation on the existing parcel uh, will likely provide the, the flood benefits or flood mitigation measures that are, that are desired by the plan. Uh, so that is the, 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 the quick recap of what the preferred plan is likely to include at this point based upon the analysis. Um, so at this point, I'll turn it back over to, to Sarah Watts from Tetra Tech, who's gonna dive a little bit deeper into some of the environmental concerns that have been considered as part of these alternative developments. Thanks, Alan. All right, so we're in the process of analyzing the impacts associated with the likely preferred alternative and, and the no action future without federal investment alternative. The positive expected outcomes and potential adverse impacts are still being evaluated fully but um, right now, this is what we're thinking. Um, so in terms of positive expected outcomes, we expect the project to result in improved public health and life safety as a result of the proposed flood damage reduction measures, um, restored riparian habitat for wildlife in the locations where buyouts and, and relocations are occurring, um, restored floodplain function behind the earthen levee that's gonna be removed that's upstream of Main Street and improve visual character or aesthetics associated with reducing flood damages. Um, and uh, right now there, there are no mapped New York State freshwater wetlands or regulated 100 foot adjacent areas that are expected to be impacted. Um, but there are some areas that do still require some further investigation. 
Um, next slide, please. So there are expected to be some temporary impacts associated with the construction activities to the resource areas like the soils, water quality, vegetation, riparian habitat, and, and public utilities or will experience some temporary uh, disruptions. There might be some reduced visual character or aesthetic appeal because levees and elevated homes might be considered less attractive. Um, and there are potential adverse impacts to threatened and endangered species or their habitats um, that might include freshwater mussels or the northern long-eared bats. However, for the, for the mussels, there's no known mussel habitat directly impacted by the project activities. Um, they may potentially occur in the Chemung River downstream of the project. And for the northern long-eared bats, they may potentially occur in the forested areas along Bentley Creek, but uh, more than likely potential impacts could be avoided by adhering to the Fish and Wildlife Service guidelines on the timing of tree, care, tree clearing activities during construction. Next slide. Um, as far as cultural resources are concerned, the project study area poses varying sensitivity for the presence of undocumented pre-contact and historic period archeological resources. So two of the likely preferred alternative features, the Wellsburg Levee and the Tyler Run realignment are in areas that were not previously surveyed for cultural resources, and they have a moderate potential archaeological sensitivity for the presence of undocumented pre-contact period archaeological resources. So project effects on cultural resources are possible in these areas, and there are no culture effects to cultural resources expected to the berm removal, the Durabilt Levee area, the bio and relocation areas um, the flood, or as a result of flood proofing or associated with the, the no action or future without federal investment alternative. Next slide. Um, the US EPA defines environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So fair treatment means no group of people should bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences resulting from industrial, governmental, or commercial operations. Um, the, the US EPA has mapped the project area as a low income area. Uh, in New York, the project area is in an area that's subject to the New York State Commissioner's policy CP29, which is related to environmental justice and permitting, and uh, may require outreach to the impacted communities. And in Pennsylvania, a portion of the project is in the Pennsylvania DEP environmental justice area block group one of the 2015 census, which indicates that a substantial portion of the population is low income. So environmental justice falls under the socioeconomic resource areas considered by NEPA. And for the likely preferred alternative, there are expected positive outcomes in terms of environmental justice related to um, improving public health and safety, and of course, reducing flood damages. And there are potential adverse impacts um, in terms of environmental justice associated with relocating families and homes and disrupting these low income communities. Um, that's all I have related to environmental concerns and I will pass things back to David. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so the next steps uh, following tonight's meeting is to, to document and assess the findings um, again of this meeting and the uh, over the following 30 days, uh, any public comments that we, we may receive um, based on what you've, uh, what's been presented this evening. Um, is following that, uh, we will be uh, working with the project sponsors to determine the preferred alternative uh, both um, on the Pennsylvania and New York sides. Uh, we'll be coordinating with various agencies and, and conducting consultation, uh, followed by document review, uh, internal review uh, by NRCS and public and agency reviews. Uh, finalize the, the plan and uh, request funding for the next phase, uh, which would be design. Next slide, please. So agency consultation, um, there's a number of agencies that, that we will be consulting with, um, both a uh, number of federal agencies, 
uh, both New York and Pennsylvania SHPO offices, um, New York State DEC, Pennsylvania Department of Environmental, Environmental Protection, um, and both New York and Pennsylvania dam safety agencies and tribal organizations with ancestral lands, both in New York and Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. A uh, rough draft of the planning uh, schedule. Uh, we're hoping to have the initial draft plan um, available for internal review, uh, followed by te technical and programmatic reviews to uh, wrap up by late July. Um, following that would be the draft plan for public and interagency review uh, by the end of August, and then final plan and approval uh, and signatures in October. Next slide, please. Uh, project status updates. Uh, I would ask that you periodically uh, look uh, or review Bradford County PA and Chemung County New York's websites for any applicable information uh, regarding the project um, as a whole. And as earlier stated, um, draft plan, uh, environmental assessment uh, draft date is we're hoping to have it done by late summer being august next slide please um, contacts uh, my contact and heather's contacts are listed on the slide we ask that with any project specific comments or questions uh, please send or concerns please send those directly to bentley creek at paracorp.com uh, you can also send them to to myself as well next slide and with that, I will turn it over to Alan. Great, thanks, David. Uh, so uh, now, now we just want to welcome any uh, any comments that anybody might have, any comments or questions. Uh, we can certainly address those now as part of this meeting. Uh, but again, we encourage uh, participation and in additional inquiries as you have time to digest the, the content presented today or tonight. Uh, you can email those to Bentley Creek at parkcorp.com, P A R E C O R P.com. Uh, we'll be screening that mailbox uh, for any incoming questions so that we can uh, respond to them in a, in a timely manner. Uh, there was a question about the availability of the recording. Uh, so if you can send your, if you would like uh, access to the recording, uh, if you can send an, an email request to that email address, and we will get a link out to you to download the recording from the project SharePoint site uh, once it is available. Um, so uh, not seeing any, uh, any hands or additional comments coming into the chat box. Uh, we are uh, about through or we are through our, our content for this evening's presentation. Uh, we certainly appreciate you joining us this, this evening. Uh, and again, uh, your, your participation is encouraged uh, in addition to David's email or Heather's email on the, the pre preceding slides. Again, you can email us at bentleycreek at parkcorp.com and we'll be uh, responding to those, those emails as they arrive. Uh, if there aren't any other comments or questions, uh, again, we thank you for, for joining us tonight and we look forward to hearing from you.